So in this problem, we have two different sections. You can see figure 3.35, we have a same thickness, uh, essentially double section with a web in between. And then in 3.36, we have a single section, again, same thickness all the way around. And pretty much what we want to do is we want to compare the torsional rigidity between the two structures. And even more specifically, we want to also adapt this L1 and L2 value. For the first case, we'll have L1 equal to L2, which will be 10 centimeters. And for the second case, we'll have L1, which will be equal to 5 centimeters, and L2, which will be equal to 15 centimeters, to essentially compare what the torsional rigidity will be. So we can actually start out this problem by saying for uh, essentially figure 3.36, so we'll focus on the, the easier one here first, just to make life a little bit, uh, a little bit nicer off the bat. Uh, so for A bar, or the area of the entire section, that is going to be L1 plus L2 times L3, where in this case, we just have L1 and L2 equal to 10. So we'll have 20 centimeters, and then L3 will be 10 centimeters. So we'll have an A bar of 200 centimeters squared. So then what we can do is we can use Brett's equation to calculate the torsional constant. So in this case, Brett's equation will be uh, torsional constant J, which is equal to 4 times A bar squared, or the area of our section, divided by the closed integral of ds divided by t. Now this might look intimidating at first, but notice that we have the same thickness for every single wall. So what's kind of nice about this is this uh, closed integral ds, we're essentially just adding up our perimeter at that point. And then we're pushing t up here to the numerator because it's the denominator of a denominator. So that makes life a little bit easier because then what we can write is we'll have 4a bar squared times the thickness, and then we'll just divide by what the perimeter is, which in this case is going to be 2 times L1 plus L2 plus L3. So we can start to plug in values to calculate what j is going to be. So from before, we said a bar is 200 centimeters squared, so a 4 times 200 centimeters squared squared, and then the thickness is going to be 0.3 centimeters. So then for the perimeter, what we have is 2 times, now notice that L1, L2, and L3 are all 10 centimeters, so we can just say 2 times 30 centimeters, and that gives a J1 cell, just to differentiate them, of about 800 centimeters to the fourth. So we found what our torsional constant is for this bottom figure here. So now what we can start to do is formulate an equation for J to calculate what it's going to be for essentially these given L values for this upper figure. So let's start working on that. So we can say for figure 3.35, so we can say the torque for all of these is going to be the summation of 2 times the area times the shear flow of these sections. So we'll have that. 2 times the first shear flow times the area of the first section plus 2 times the shear flow of the second section times the area of the second section. And those added up together are going to equal our torque. So now with this, uh, what we can say is a 1 bar, in this case, is going to be L1 times L3. And a 2 bar here is going to be equal to L2 times L3. So now the next step that we want to do is we want to calculate what the twist rates are going to be for both sections. So let's start off by calculating the twist rate for the first section. So the formula for this is going to be 2 times the shear modulus times a 1 bar, and then we'll multiply by the open integral of the shear flow times ds divided by t. So now in this case, t is actually constant, so we can pull that out of the integral, and then we can substitute what our a1 bar is. So we'll have 1 divided by 2 times g, and we'll have l1 l3 times the thickness. Now essentially what this integral is doing here is, remember it's summing up our perimeters by multiplying by the corresponding shear flow. 
So let me first start writing out. So we'll have Q1, right? So we're going to look at this first box here, which will correspond to this. So this will be where our shear one, um, or shear flow one, is going to be going around. So notice that shear flow one, or Q1, it's going through this side, which is L1, then it's going through this side, which is has a length of L3, and then it's going through this side, which has a length of L1. So it's essentially going through two L1s worth of, of distance, and it's going through one L3 worth of distance. So we could write that Q1 is being multiplied by two L1 plus L3, because we have Q, and then we have the closed integral with the ds, which is essentially summing up the perimeter. And then we have one final side for this, and that's going to be this one right here. But notice it's not q1 or necessarily q2 going through, it's q1, 2, which this is actually going to be a combination of both q1 and q2. Now, if you've done mesh current analysis in electrical systems before, this is actually very similar to it. Now, if you haven't done it, that's perfectly fine. That's just kind of what I think about when I look at problems like these. Whereas if we have, let's say, a joint. Let me zoom in here. So we say this is going to be our joint. What we want is all of the shear flows going in and out of that joint to be equal to 0. So we can see at this point, we're going to have Q1 going in. We're going to have Q12 going out. And then if we were to continue this around, where we have Q2, it's going to keep looping, keep looping, keep looping. It's going to get to the joint, and then it's going to start to leave this joint. So we can say that Q2 is also leaving the joint. So what we can say is all of the shear flows going into a joint are going to be positive. So Q1 is going to be positive, but all of the shear flows leaving a joint is going to be negative. So Q1, 2 can be negative, and Q2 can also be negative. So what we can say for this joint, let's... um. Let's write it over here. So we can say we want the shear flows going in that joint to be zero. So we can say Q1 is going into the joint, so it's going to be positive. We can say Q12 is going out, so it's going to be negative. And then Q2 is also going out, so it's going to be negative. So we can write this in a different way, such that we can say Q12 is equal to Q1 minus Q2. And then we can actually use this to calculate the twist rate. Because now what we can say is over here, oh, let me reconfigure. So now what we can say is with our Q12, so we'll have plus Q12 times L3. And then that'll be our twist rate for uh, essentially that first section. Because Q12 is passing a length of L3. But here we can actually substitute Q12 just to get this in terms of Q1 and Q2. So we can write this as Q1 minus Q2 times L3. And then we just finished the first twist rate. So now we can start to work through this, this second twist rate now that we kind of have a feel for it. And it'll be the same uh, pretty much format for the equation. So we'll have 1 divided by 2 times the shear, um, shear modulus times a bar of 2, and we'll have the essentially closed integral of the shear flow ds divided by t. Again, t is going to be constant here. So we'll have 1 divided by 2 times g, and then we'll take a 2 bar from before, which we said was L2, L3, and then we'll multiply it by the thickness. Now here, let's kind of think about what we're doing. So we're going to have our shear flow. So in this case, we're in the second section, so we're going to focus on Q2 first. So now Q2, notice it's going to pass through a length of L2, then it's going to pass through a length of L3, and then through another length of L2. So we can multiply Q2 by 2L2, and then we can add L3. Now with this next part here, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. So Q2 is going to go around in this direction. So we'll have some arrows to point which direction it's going. Then it'll go down here in the opposite direction of Q12. 
So this is going to be slightly different from before because instead of Q1 going in the same direction as Q12, now Q2 is going in the opposite direction of Q12. So essentially what we have to do is we have to take the negative of Q12 for this uh, twist rate. So we'll have to say negative Q1 minus Q2, where this here is Q12. And then this will still pass through a length of L3. And then now we have both of our twist rates. But now due to compatibility, we have to say that the twist rate 1 is equal to the twist rate 2, which we can just say is equal to theta. And we say this is due to compatibility. OK. So what this means is now we can say so theta 1 is equal to theta 2. So now what we can do is we can start to rework both of our twist rate equations to find a relation between Q1 and Q2, because this will help us with calculating our torsional constant later on in the problem. So what we can start off by doing, now just notice that we have 2G, 2G, L3T, L3T. So off the bat, I'm just going to cancel those out by setting these uh, two equations equal. So then by starting out with twist rate 1, we'll have Q1 divided by L1. We'll have 2 times L1 plus 2 times L3 minus Q2 L3 divided by L1. So essentially all I'm doing um, off the bat, here I'll set that equal just to show it equals Q2, um, but essentially what we're doing is we're distributing the Q's, so we'll have Q1 to L, and then we'll have uh, Q1, L3, Q1, L3, so that's where we get the 2 from. And then we'll have minus Q2, L3 divided by L1. And then similarly, with the second twist rate, we'll have Q2 divided by L2 times 2L2 plus 2L3 minus Q1, L3 divided by L2. And then what we can do is we can continue working this out. And then what we should end up with is Q2 is equal to 2 plus 2 uh, times L3 divided by L1 plus L3 divided by L2 divided by 2 plus 2 times L3 divided by L2 plus L3 divided by L1 times Q1. So now we actually have a relation between both of our shear flows in the first and the second section. So now the next step that we can do is we can use the relation um, that we drew up here for the torque. And we can use their values of A1 and A2 to substitute into uh, the torque equation. And then what we can do is we can fill in um, a very important equation with our torsional constant which is equal to torque divided by the shear modulus times the twist rate. So plugging in all of these values, we should get 4L1, L3 times L1, L3, Q1 plus L2, L3, Q2 times T. And then in the denominator, we should have 2Q1, L1 plus 2Q1, L3, and then minus Q2, L3. And now notice for um, essentially the twist rate, you can either use the first or the second one. Uh, I just use the first one, but in the end, we should get the same thing because it should be equal due to compatibility. So now we are finally there. So we can calculate case by case to figure out what our torsional constant is going to be. So we can say for case one, so we said that L1 is equal to L2, which is equal to 10 centimeters. And L3 is equal to 10 centimeters as well. Now, notice with this, uh, we can find the relation between Q2 and Q1. And what's actually kind of nice is they turn out to be the same thing because all of our lengths are the same so then we essentially have the same numerator and denominator. So I'll write that out. So pretty much from this, we can say that Q1 
q2 is equal to q1. So that's kind of nice. But then uh, to make the analysis a little bit easier, since all the lengths are the same, let's say that l is equal to l1, l2, and l3, where l is equal to 10 centimeters. So now with both of these uh, combined, what we can do is we can solve for the torsional constant. So I'll just start plugging in values here. So I'll try to get both in the same frame. So we'll have 4L squared, and we'll have Q1L squared. Now you can choose Q1 or Q2. They're going to cancel out anyways. And then we'll have plus L squared Q1 times the thickness. And then we'll divide by, uh, so it'll be 2Q1L plus 2Q1L. Oh, just leave L by itself. And then minus Q1 times L. So this can be simplified to be 3Q1L, 4L squared, Q1, and we'll have 2L squared times T. So we can cancel out the Qs, uh, we can cancel out an L, and then we should be left with 8 thirds L cubed times T. Which this then can come out to 8 thirds, 10 centimeters cubed, 0.3 centimeters. <clears throat> so we can write that J2 cell 1, so the first case, is going to be 800 centimeters to the fourth. <coughs> so now, excuse me, uh, so now we just have one more case. So we can say for case 2 here, we said that L1 is equal to 5 centimeters. L2 is equal to 15, and L3 is equal to 10. So then we can pretty much follow the same format. So we can solve for the relation between Q2, Q1, so I'm just plugging in the L values here. And then from this, we get that Q2 is equal to 1.25 Q1. So then what we can do is pretty much follow the same torsional uh, constant equation up here. We can plug in the L1, L2, and L3 values, and we can substitute Q1 or Q2 for the other, and then they should cancel out. And then from here, we should be left with a torsional constant for the two cell two of about 814.29 centimeters to the fourth. So in the end, we can say, hence, adding a vertical web does not, I repeat, does not significantly improve torsional rigidity, or JG. And with that, it's kind of a, an interesting problem because we can see the original, so as we just have a, um, just a, a section on its own without any webbing, but then we can have the webbing directly in the center and then compare how the torsional rigidity compares as we scoot the webbing over slightly to the left. And we can see in the end, we don't get too much of a difference. We only get about what, 14.29 centimeters uh, to the fourth. So it's a very, very small difference by adding the webbing. 